Good morning, everybody. My name is Richard Whitlock, and I am master of the Worshipful Company of Farmers. Thank you for joining us for the launch of our research paper titled Farm Labour in the UK, Accessing the Workforce the Industry Needs. These are challenging times for farming. Here we are in a post-Brexit Britain, reform of the agricultural policy, living with COVID lockdown and a shortage of labour. A lot of industries are suffering from a shortage of labour and agriculture has to compete with a wider industry. I'm very pleased to say that we have an insightful and um, make you think um, report to present to you today. Um, and we've been fortunate to uh, have uh, co two co-authors working with us on this project, uh, Professor Matt Lobley and Dr. Caroline Nye, both from, the, from Exeter University. Um, the support has been co-sponsored with the Worshipful Company of Farmers with the generous support of the John Oldacre Charitable Trust, and we thank them for their financial support in this situation. Um, can I ask please that uh, when attendees are coming into the programme, they go on to full screen mode and ask questions when you're looking um, uh, via the chat box, which if you look at the bottom of your screen, you will see there is a Q&A and a chat box there, and we ask you to use the Q&A to ask your questions to the panel. I will present to you a brief resume of the programme. Uh, first of all, I'll introduce Professor Matt Lobley and Dr. Caroline Nye. Then we will have a presentation of the research findings by Caroline. Panel opinions and discussion will follow, then a Q&A, summary and concluding remarks by Professor Lobley, and then thank you and close by me. So first of all, I would like to welcome into, onto the panel, Professor Matt Lobley. Matt is co-director of the Center for Rural Policy Research at Exeter University. Professor Lobley has authored over 100 publications, has written a book on farming in the UK post-Brexit, and is co-editor of a very, very old book. When I remember, when I was a young agricultural student, this is what I had, and I've still got that original copy of a product called the Agricultural Notebook. The other person I'd like to welcome on to present uh, the research report is Dr. Caroline Nye. Caroline completed her PhD in 2017 on agricultural labor in the UK. Very pertinent, Caroline. She is now a research fellow and social scientist at the Center for Research Policy at Exeter University. Before becoming an academic, Caroline had first-hand experience of working on farms in the UK, US, and Costa Rica, and she speaks fluent Spanish. Um, so I will now hand over to Caroline, please, to present your report findings. Hi everyone, thank you very much for coming and thanks to the Worshipful Company of Farmers for this opportunity. I'm going to jump straight. The report in its entirety covered a number of different aspects relating to farm labour and farm labour shortages, but due to the fact that there was already so much out there on seasonal labour, migrant workers and um, horticultural work, what I'll be doing today is concentrate more on the more permanent labour requirements with a focus on recruitment from the domestic workforce. Of course, both aspects are interlinked and so some of what I say will cross over into both realms. The study aimed to collate some of the existing data on farm labour shortages across all sectors and examines the various drivers behind labour shortages. We try to approach the issue from a solution oriented stance um, rather, than examining, rather than examining the inherent and systemic uh, 
problems arising from specific issues, such as exploitation in the workplace, or the social implications of mechanising work, for example. Issues around farm labour are far more nuanced than many people are aware, and there's some really great work being carried out which looks at these various aspects in much more detail, which I'm happy to share um, details of if you're interested. Um, the first part of this study was made up of desk-based research, looking at literature um, dealing with farm labour from as far back as the 1970s, and also draws upon academic articles, policy reports, press features, and other technical industry reports. And in addition to this, we wanted to try and explore potential solutions to the farm labour crisis, and in particular, what this might look like in terms of the domestic workforce. So we interviewed a variety of stakeholders key to this agenda, like um, labour experts, farmers, farm business representatives, um, and then a number of people who run initiatives, but specifically who work with particular groups of people who have the potential to move into full-time skilled farming careers. Um, the initiatives we spoke to included those who work with service leavers, ex-offenders, young people, and career changers. So when I started researching farm labour in the UK about six years ago, there were very few people looking at this. And where there were, the majority were looking at seasonal labour only, particularly migrant workers in the horticulture industry, which is super important, but there wasn't much being done anywhere else. And it was described by me and agricultural expert Charlie Clutterbuck um, as a blind spot in agricultural research. Um, now, farm labour has become quite a hot topic, uh, not only in academia, but also across industry, in the media, and in policy making. DEFRA now has its own workforce planning and access to labour team because the issue is becoming so prevalent. Um, many industry sectors are actively trying to encourage um, new recruits into the workforce through their own schemes. And um, as we'll hear a bit later, a new institute called the Institute for Agriculture and Horticulture has been set up specifically to be the home of professional development and training for agriculture and horticulture. So are labour shortages in farming a new phenomenon? No, not really. Um, in fact, as far back as the 14th century, farms reported farm labour shortages. And in the 18th century, um, low employment rates in Ireland drove Irish workers over to Great Britain to fill the already existing vacancies that were happening there. And with, with regards to non-seasonal, more permanent work, um, such as dairy work, a labour expert reported issues with labour shortages occurring during the 1960s and the 1970s. And these have continued and got worse for many holdings um, over the last 50 years or so. So now we find ourselves at what some believe to be a point of crisis. Um, a point which has been largely overlooked until fairly recently, especially when looking at more permanent labour shortages. And what needs to be hammered home is that labour is not simply an issue for the horticulture sector. It affects eggs, poultry, it affects dairy, pigs and even arable. And a large study in the southwest a few years ago discovered that a huge 87% of over 1,250 farmers uh, or farm businesses rely on agricultural contractors to work their land and yet some of these agricultural contracting businesses um, are also struggling to find workers so this is a problem that affects all sectors so it needs to be addressed across all sectors and there is this assumption that at some point mechanization and digital agriculture will solve all labor issues um, and whether that's the case or not is another question entirely. Um, but that leaves a significant gap. And that gap is important because so much can happen in between. There could be a drop in production for certain businesses. Some farms will go out of business because they cannot get access to the labour they need. Some farms, in terms of the, the more seasonal work um, requirements, will move their holdings to countries where they can get workers. There will be an increase in slavery and exploitation, both in this country and in those other countries where work is moved to. Um, and it exacerbates mental health issues in farming. And that isn't really talked about much in relation to farm labour shortages, but it is happening. People who can't get access to the labour they need, it's incredibly stressful as year on year, they just don't know what's happening. Um, and there are also some people who are beginning to ask if we even want our entire agricultural workforce to be swapped out for robots. 
um, and what might this mean for skills associated with land work. Um, I personally think there will always be a role for human workers, but this is again debatable and it's a whole other issue that needs exploring. So how do we counter the shortages in farm labour? Well, we look at why they exist in the first place. So according to our study, there are three principal drivers of shortages in farm labour with regards to permanent positions as well as seasonal positions. And these are farm level, local level and national level. And you can see there are a number of farm level factors. Um, there's a perception, for example, that work is poorly paid, um, when in reality, many permanent jobs in farming pay very well and they come with perks such as a house and some farm managers earn over nine, 90 to 100,000 pounds a year. Um, poor farm culture is a really big issue that needs much more work. Um, what this means is employers just lack people management skills and they might be unwilling or unable to train workers on or farm. Some employers put workers off by poor delegation of tasks um, or just by exhibiting a really a lack of forward thinking. Um, another significant barrier is the perception that workers need to come from a farming background and this attitude immediately cuts out huge swathes of society who have the potential to become brilliant farm workers. Um, poor recruitment processes prevent employers from, from accessing the workforce they need. A study not so long ago found that 55% of um, farmers still rely on word of mouth for sourcing their workers, which is it limits them enormously in this very inefficient way of finding, finding farm workers, especially nowadays. Um, and finally, traditional forms of succession mean that farm businesses aren't, are often not being taken over by the person who is actually right for the job, because it just automatically goes to the son, if not the firstborn son. So while this often pushes daughters to go and be farm workers elsewhere, they don't always. So it perpetuates a gender dynamic within the agricultural workforce when many women are far more qualified, willing and able to run a business or do really high level farm work um, as compared to their male siblings or their male peers. Okay, in terms of local level, these drivers are often discussed in terms of, of um, kind of barriers to seasonal work. Um, but they also apply to much of the permanent workforce as well. So lack of affordable accommodation in rural areas, poor transport and infrastructure in and to rural areas, poor broadband in rural areas. Rural areas have themselves become a real blind spot in terms of all these things which become very off-putting to potential recruits. Um, and another issue that came up, which people don't talk about, is uh, poor community relations between landowners and, and other rural locals. Um, which creates yet another barrier between potential non-farming recruits and careers in agriculture. And then at a more national level, as we all know, um, there is a real gap in understanding um, and a gap in education about food production, um, which lots of people are working to resolve, but I think more work needs to be done on that. There is an antiquated public image of what farm work entails and because the only farm work people ever see in the media is fruit picking, all negative associations of that type of work are then automatically transferred to other ideas of farm work. Um, there aren't enough apprenticeships in the industry and more research needs to work out why this is and how it can be resolved. Um, key influences in the lives of young people such as parents, teachers, careers advisors, will often discourage really bright kids from going into agriculture um, because they just don't understand agriculture themselves. And obviously there is a, a lack of promotion by the industry itself, although this is finally gradually beginning to change a bit. Um, so many more things. Something I haven't mentioned here is that it, uh, it's important to note that farming is not the only industry experiencing labour shortages. Um, construction, civil engineering, telecommunications, they're all competing to attract domestic labour as well as non-domestic non workers with settled status. So farming really needs to up its game to become highly competitive with these. They're not just competing with other farmers, they're competing with other industries. So there's so much work to be done. And then of course there are the limitations caused by the new immigration policy. The current seasonal worker scheme is aimed towards meeting labour demands during peak production periods mainly caters to the horticultural sector, 
is probably pretty unlikely to even meet the demands of the horticulture sector unless something changes. Um, the points-based system doesn't really cater to any farm labour vacancies and lots of stakeholders I've spoken to believe that the Migration Advisory Com Committee should add workers to, such as dairy workers, to the shortage occupation list, which so far it has not. So what are the solutions to the labour shortages for the more permanent roles? Well, we're not, reinvent we're not reinventing the wheel here. It's a really slow hill climb to change the reputation of farm work to encourage a greater number of recruits from within the domestic workforce. And the industry and its varying sectors really need to continue to find solutions. Um, as I said, we spoke to a number of stakeholders already running initiatives who do believe it's possible some of whom you'll hear from shortly. What is key is that the industry stops focusing on the tiny pool of from a farming background labour market and open up to the potential of the wider labour market. So some examples of service leavers um, recognised as ideal candidates for such roles. And there are a number of initiatives already in existence who match, match um, potential workers to roles in land-based careers. Ex-offenders, now there's nothing, in, there's no specific um, scheme which exists to facilitate this on its own, but the new futures network run by the Ministry of Justice um, is beginning to match some ex-offenders with jobs in farming, but it's a lot more work needs to be done in that area, but um, ex-offenders have been identified as really potentially excellent recruits to, to careers in farming. I spoke to a number of um, other initiatives who work with ex-offenders in different industries, um, which is really eye-opening, and there's much more of that in the report. Of course, you've got young people and career changes making up for the rest. So to most of these people right now, farming is an invisible career. Um, so what we really need is to get all of those levels, farm level, local level, national level, working together to create a sea change in how farming is regarded by potential recruits, um, wherever they might come from, and um, encourage support, facilitate new initiatives to facilitate the matching process. Because without somebody to facilitate the matching process, you could have somebody really, really interested in a career in farming. And you might have a farmer really needing a worker, but there's a real gap in how to link these people up. Um, it, they need help. So um, yeah, that's what these initiatives do. And there are lots of other initiatives out there doing something similar. So it's become a marketplace of opportunity for really good farm workers, and they will go to the best employers because they can. So farmers really need to be helped to become better employers through training, such as the management and leadership courses run by AHDB. They need to be better managers. They need to be able to provide better accommodation if accommodation is a part of the deal. They need to create a better work culture and then all of these things will help them to create a better reputation and draw workers to a vacancy. Many farms do not have their own HR departments, but this doesn't mean that they don't need to professionalize how they run their business. Um, farmers need to stop passing their farm automatically to, the, to their firstborn son or to their son and consider instead who might be best placed to actually make the farm a success. It might very well be their daughter or somebody who is not even a relation. Um, these things are so culturally entrenched in, in the agricultural world and they need challenging in, in order to make businesses, especially um, small, small family farms, more, more resilient um, moving into the future. And new recruits need to be helped, not only through more and better apprenticeships, um, such as the Kickstarter scheme, entrepreneurs in dairying, and the Trailblazer apprenticeships, but also halfway training institutions, which don't necessarily require that kind of formal training, such as that set up by the Access to Agriculture scheme by Harper Adams, um, which is specifically aimed at people from non-farming backgrounds. And for career changes, they might want uh, to take a different route, such as going through an incubator scheme like Farm Start or the Fresh Start Land Enterprise, which um, there's more about in the report again. Um, 
which help people who might be interested in setting up their own business as farmers. Um, it helps them gain experience in, in running a farm, working on a farm without the outlay of um, having to actually purchase or rent their own land and all the equipment and everything that goes with it. So um, there's much more to uh, incubate opportunities than that, such as mentorship, etc. So they're really good schemes to, to help people move um, into learning about farm work. So what else needs to happen? Um, educational establishment, establishments need to talk to farmers and vice versa to ensure needs are being met um, and acquired skill sets are delivered on the ground. There's lots of farmers stated that people are coming from agricultural colleges or universities and they just don't have the right skills to, um, to work on their farm. The influencers need influencing. So careers advisors, parents, teachers, people need educating as to what a career in farming means in the 21st century. And this needs to be done fairly aggressively. Um, it's still the case that the bright students are steered away from farming, um, when actually what it needs now is really intelligent people. But it's important to point out that if the number of workers from the domestic workforce increases, there's still likely to be a reliance on migrant workers. So the seasonal worker scheme needs to accommodate the needs of all sectors, not just horticulture. Definitions of farm labour skills need to be revisited by the Migration Advisory Committee so that the farming industry isn't disadvantaged by the new immigration policy. Um, or certain sectors aren't disadvantaged by the new immigration policy. And then and to enable all of this, I think more, more efficient data collection needs to occur so that all labour requirements are recorded and recognised across the industry, across all sectors. And then we also need more research into skills, into the migrant worker situation, into exploitation, into mechanisation and responsible research and innovation and social impact. And also we need to do more research into the domestic workforce because people talk about recruiting them all the time and yet there seems to be no, no in-depth work on a, on a large scale looking at how we can actually recruit um, more people from the domestic workforce. So this is the beginning, but hopefully more will come from it. Um, So, while the report does in many places touch upon seasonal work, migrant workers and immigration policy, the conclusion of the study, along with many other studies, is that in the short term, it's highly unlikely that the domestic workforce uh, will ever be able to fill the seasonal vacancies that have for the last few decades been filled by migrant workers, but they might be able to fill some of the more permanent roles. They should be able to fill some of the more permanent roles. One of the benefits of the COVID-19 pandemic is that people are really re-evaluating where they want to live, how they want to live, what gives their life meaning. So the time is ripe really for harnessing that interest in, in new lifestyle aspirations. Um, a few years ago, I interviewed about 50 people who were working in agriculture. And one of the questions I asked them was, if you could go back and do it all again, would you choose the career that you're in now? And every single one of them said yes. Um, these are really interesting, challenging and rewarding careers. And this needs to be brought to the attention of the world outside of farming. Um, and this needs to be done sooner rather than later before, for many farms, it's just simply too late. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed for that, Caroline. Uh, very insightful, insightful, some hard hitting points. And uh, I think those are some of the opportunities for the panel to pick up on. But you at home as well, watching on your screen, if you want to now, the Q&A chat is open. So please put your questions as we progress through the panel lineup and in response to Caroline's presentation, put them on the Q&A and I will try to pick up on them as we go through that part of the session. So we are now on to the uh, panel opinions and discussion lineup. And I'd like to uh, welcome and put your screen on in order as I call you, please. Uh, first of all, David Thurston. Uh, David is chairman of Dyson Farming and chairman of the Development Board for the Institute of Agriculture and Horticulture, chaired the 2013 Future of Farming Review and is past president of the CLA. Uh, Tessa Howe, senior skills manager at the AHDB, sits on the Food and Drink Sector Council representing the industry on workforce and skills and lead on the Skills and Task 
Group for the Agricultural Productivity Task Force. Sheena Howden, Lantra Scotland Agricultural Training Board Project Manager, as well as a partner with her husband in their mixed family farm in Perthshire. Next is Fiona Galbraith. Following a 23 year career in the army, Fiona is now in Civvy Street. She is a founder of Rural Link to help find career pathways in the land-based sector for ex-military personnel. She is a trustee of About Turn and has an MSc in Rural Estate Management from the Royal Agricultural University. Paul Parfit, head of the farming estate at Quicks Dairy Farmers in Devon and makers of multi-award winning handmade cloth bound slowly matured cheddar cheese and goat's cheese. And last, but by certainly no means least, Beverly Dixon, HR Director at G's Fresh, one of Europe's leading salad and vegetable producers. Beverly is actively involved in talent acquisition, leadership and career development. Beverly spent most of her career in HR at Marks and Spencers. Welcome to our panel. Remember to start your questions going as we, as we um, run people at home. And I would first of all like to ask David Fursden to comment on um, the issues facing the industry and anything he would like to comment on the report that Caroline's presented. David. Thank you, uh, Richard. And um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I just want to say really <clears throat> a bit about um, TIA, which I am chairing. And I think that dictates my uh, view really on the, on the skills agenda. And we want TIA to be um, the Institute for Agriculture and Horticulture to be a home for skills, careers and professionalism throughout the industry. And the report that we have uh, heard about this morning is really about the workforce. And I think we want to take it not only to be the workforce, but also to be uh, farmers um, who employ the workforce as well. And so it was refreshing to see in the report uh, mentioned about the need for new management and leadership skills um, and promoting careers and getting labour market information together and how that relates to government policy, which I think is really important. Um, we want a professional industry, we need a professional industry so that people can demonstrate uh, what farming is all about. And that will bring people in, but it will also help them um, and demonstrate their production skills, their environmental skills, animal welfare skills, and health and safety skills, all necessary today. And to do this, um, TIA is aiming to have an online portal that will take people towards suitable training opportunities provided by uh, partners. And um, we want to try and personalize that and record people's achievements. And uh, that has to be a, um, uh, uh, provided by something which is self-funding. So although uh, DEFRA are providing a bit of funding for us at the start, um, we will end up um, having to pay for that if we want this to work properly. So we hope people will engage with us. Um, for me, these are crucial if we're going to deal with the trade challenges at the moment, uh, the changes in agricultural support, um, the focus on climate change and on carbon. And I don't believe we're quite ready to address those issues as an industry. I think we've got more work to do and what we want to do in TIA and what we're trying to do uh, also at Dyson Farming and so on is to provide people that can cope with all the things that are coming down the tracks at them uh, at a really challenging time for the farming industry. Thanks, Great. Richard. Thank you, David. Uh, Tess, over to you. Thank you, Richard. So um, we've been asked really to talk about the importance of training to be better employers. And we're aware that um, labour is an increasingly scarce resource, not only the, the migrant labour, but really the, the working force age population as well. So it's hitting us from all sides. And we're not just competing with our neighbours or other farmers, there's other sectors we're now competing with that might be able to offer better conditions. So we really need to review how we're doing things and, and support the farmers in matching the expectations of, of employees and, and what they can offer. 
So as a sector, lots of employers have their roles, not because of their skill set and their suitability, but because of family succession, as, as Caroline was explaining, or others get promoted because of their technical ability, not because of their, their personal skills. And that does cause a lot of problems in the industry and, and cause recruitment and retention issues. So we also then have people working on the same business for a long, long period of time. So we don't get that external view and that mix of, of what else goes on in, in, the, in the world. So all of this contributes to people and their ability of whether or not they're a good employer. Um, being a good leader and manager is natural for some people, but it's not for, for everybody. And the good news for that is that we actually can develop people in this area. And we've seen that over the training programs that Worship Company of Farmers run and, and we've run ourselves as well. So we do have a mass of untapped potential in the industry. And I think that's something we really need to hold on to. Um, I think the argument we, we always have, so we, we see lots of employees frustrated with their employer because they were told, but that's what we've always done. And, and yes, in the past, we did have to work 17 hour days on a routine basis, but things have moved on now. And we really need to look at where people, um, what people want to do and how we can match expectations with what we're offering as well. So I think we need to shift that perception of you're only a good farmer if you're at work every hour of the day, every day of the week. Um, and we need to remember that our employees have got a life outside of work um, and that increasing um, focus on work-life balance is something that we really need to, to shift um, in, in the industry as well. So we know that many employers would benefit from the training, but we also know research is there to show those that are actually the most in need, completely unaware of that need um, and probably unwilling to pick up the phone and, and engage in some kind of training. So. And it's difficult training, even for the people that are aware, for them to, to stand up and say, we need to change our mindset, we need to change our behaviours is, is something that's hard to do. So where we found um, success in doing this is really building a, a secure environment um, and an interactive way of learning with people. And, and by secure, I mean building a group of people so that you've got a peer network to, to help people and one that they can build trust with each other and one where they understand each other's problems as well. So. Um, Key to that obviously is the, the trainer, having a really good trainer, but actually the success we find in the training programs we run is that peer network um, of, of people that are willing to share their real life experience and, and willing to um, share their own ideas and, and, and constructive criticism with people. So the key elements we find are providing an environment really that gives people time to think and reflect on different ways of doing things, because it really is about mindset change, the, the, the answer to a lot of what Caroline's um, raised in her report. Um, time to test ideas as well. So when we're doing training, people need to go back and, and try it. Accepting that it won't always work, there's different ways of doing things, and accepting that what's a success for you won't work for someone else. So it's always about finding different pathways. Um, and really, we see the biggest change when the peers challenge each other. And, and really question what people are doing and why they're doing it. And they can be hard conversations, but that's where we see the biggest difference. So I think taking people out of their comfort zone is really important as well. And I know with, with the, the program that I run, it originally was for pig farmers and I deliberately ran it on a weaning day and all the managers were in outcry of, of how would I do it on such a busy day? And actually when we, when we ran it for two days and I said, we'll come back and review, they all came back and said weaning happens a lot better when we're not involved and maybe we shouldn't be involved in everything and we should get on with running the business so it's just little lessons like that can can have a big difference and i think we get that's one of the biggest feedbacks we get from our programs is that they stop by having the right skill set they can manage their staff properly um, and they can start to work on the business rather than in the business and it's the concept we were taught in the challenge of rural leadership as well about stepping off the dance floor and, and taking a look from the balcony and I think the research that we've seen today, the barriers that have, have been brought forward, there really is a lot of that is in our gift to, to change as an industry. If we can move forward and proactively match what the labour want and what we need and what is available to us. And I think there's a lot of opportunity for us going forward. Thank you, Tess. That's great. Um, next on to Sheena, please. Good morning, everyone. Um, firstly, thank you very much for the invitation to join you today. Um, Lantra Scotland, we work slightly differently than our English um, colleagues and that we are funded by the Scottish Government to deliver on three key themes related to skills in the land-based sector. Today, I was particularly asked to focus on how we encourage young people and career changers to take up a career in farming. 
Now, we work really closely with agricultural industry, industry bodies, the education sector, and many others. And we also sit on industry skills groups, including the Skills for Farming group. One of the, the ways we encourage young people to take up a career in farming is using our industry champions. These are new entrants um, who've been finalists in our annual awards, and they've excelled in their learning, both work-based and academic, and they do an exceptional job of promoting their industries. The champions are both young people and career changers. We do a lot of promotion via social media. We develop career resources, for example, 360 interactive videos, career videos, interactive presentations, STEM resources. Uh, we also run career influencer events for teaching staff, career staff, parents, etc. Now we ensure we use a diverse range of images and case studies in our resources, um, and we're also asked to contribute to partners' career resources. We also um, support new career initiatives to help fill this skills gap. I just want to give you just a couple of um, short examples. Um, firstly, our Growing Rural Talent pilot project. It was set up initially to address shortages in the dairy industry. It offers school pupils the opportunity to work a day a week in industry whilst also achieving a qualification. This project has achieved really positive results with a large percentage once leaving school either directly enter the industry, progress on to a modern apprenticeship or on to further and higher education. Another initiative is the pre-apprenticeship pilot program aimed this time at school leavers. Farmers had identified that although they required assistance on the farm, they were uncertain about employing someone with no experience. Over a hundred young people have now completed the program with the majority either going straight into employment progressing to a modern apprenticeship or to further and higher education. And there's another 35, at least 35 waiting to start this month. What is key to these programmes is that many of these young people come from an urban background, it has attracted females and a large proportion had never considered agriculture as a career before. But there's no point in us promoting careers and then not having opportunities open to them. Um, to help encourage farmers to take on an apprentice, we are funding at the moment a small apprenticeship pilot where farmers are receiving funding towards the cost of an apprenticeship salary. Um, we also had the, um, the government supporting an agricultural employers grant where they were given £5,000 towards the cost of an apprentice's salary and there's been an increase in the number of agricultural apprentices because of that. We're also leading on the Women in Agriculture Practical Training Fund, which supports women to undertake skills training to build up their confidence. There is a particular emphasis on new entrants in this fund, and it was as a result of a report produced by a task force set up by the Scottish Government to help change the male-dominated culture in farming. And to date, I've um, committed £170,000 um, towards the training. The, the government have given us £225,000 and we'll look at whether other funding is available if this um, existing funding is used up. Um, I just wanted to give you a few examples of the type of work. Sheena, so can I, can I just chase things on, please? Um, <laughs> you know, if you've got something you want to briefly say that's really important, otherwise I need to try to keep moving through the speech. No, that's, that's, me, that's me finished. Thanks. Lovely. Thank you. Now, Fiona, you're from the other side of the uh, employment challenge. So you've been uh, looking for um, em employment opportunities for ex-military. So you come at it from a very different perspective. What would you like to tell us? Uh, good morning and thank you very much um, for inviting me. Um, I will keep my remarks uh, short, but I just want to share um, two slides with you very briefly. So um, Rural Link, uh, we believe very strongly that service leavers um, have something to offer in terms of productivity to food and farming um, and address um, some of the issues that um, have been raised this morning and are very prevalent in the report. Um, who is this person um, on the left? Let me introduce you to them. Um, this individual may be an officer who's been to Sandhurst, or, um, the best known of the three service academies, but could be from the Air Force or the um, Navy, could be a warrant officer who's a manager, so you've got leaders and managers, 
um, who've had a lot of investment in that side of their training, might be a soldier, sailor, or airman who's a technical expert. And the business of defence is now a very, very technical um, business. Um, it might be an engineer, it might be a communication specialist, might be an um, UAV or drone pilot, might be a data analyst, and so on and so on. He's, he or she is conditioned to deliver, he's accustomed to change roles every two or three years and learn a, a, a significantly new role and is now seeking stability as he or she leaves the service. You know about the person on the right and down the middle of this slide are the values um, arranged by the mnemonic farmers that are shared between the Fiona, I think we've lost your sound. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can. Yeah, so the new entrant might be, as we've heard, a graduate, an apprentice, uh, a farming family member. Um, and uh, But what age are they? What life experience do they have? And what fresh ideas in problem solving um, do they bring? The service lever goes through a journey that at Rural Link we describe by this pathway. Um, unlike most career changes, they leave the service either because they come to the end of a predefined contract or because they're seeking stability or um, a, a new balance. They have to give a year's notice, so they often leave the service without knowing what they're going towards, which makes them what we call a career seeker. Um, they then find and narrow down what they're looking for, and we then call them a career developer. And at that point where they're able to target what they're looking for, and we then um, are looking for a gateway job where they're going to use a lot of what they bring with them, but they've still got quite a, a lot to learn about the sector they're going into. And this is where the employer comes in. Um, and very quickly, to give you an example, this um, picture on the right is Becca. She was a warfare officer in the Royal Navy a year ago. She's now working on a 2,000 head dairy farm in southwest Scotland, where she is the dairy manager. She hadn't previously worked with cattle. Um, she attended an insight day at the career seeker stage, fell in love um, with the dairy business um, and started milking for the whole every morning voluntarily um, while she was on that uh, one week course. She then um, had to go back to sea to finish off her time at sea um, on board the warship, which she was second in command of. Um, she then um, came to one of Aurora Link's events and had her enthusiasm reignited, having given up and thought she was going to accept a job officer, a job offer as a regional manager in Amazon Logistics. We got her a one week work experience placement um, on the farm she now works on. On day four, they were so impressed with her attitude, her ability to learn and her ability to get on with people that they offered her a job that didn't previously exist. And within two months, she'd become the dairy manager. She clearly has still a lot to learn um, and she still hasn't been through a full year on the farm, but she's able to add so much value that she is the dairy manager. Um, I'm very happy to be supporting this report and very happy um, to take further questions, of course. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And now call, can I call on Paul about the uh, dairy sector? Thank you, Richard, and um, thank you for inviting me today. Um, yes, as somebody obviously employing and recruiting staff, I thought I would talk about um, the different approach we've taken in the last two and a half years um, to, to try and address some of the, um, the items previous speakers have, uh, have mentioned. So we, <clears throat> as a brief over, over, um, overview, we employ 11 people on the farm currently. Um, six of those people um, are responsible for milking cows. Uh, we farm, well, the estate is a thousand hectares. Um, actively, we farm about 550 hectares. Um, I've got two milking herds, um, a spring and an autumn. So at 4.30 a.m. each day, I need one person milking currently 280 cows and another person milking 328 cows currently. Um, historically, we've turned over two to three members of staff annually. Um, now, for the last 12 months, um, we've been very stable with our, um, with our team. Um, we have just um, lost a member of the uh, team uh, who is progressing to work for the uh, animal plant health. 
Um, so we've just literally gone through a recruitment process um, in the last month. Uh, what we've brought in to try and address some of the other issues um, that, that have been highlighted is we've expanded our training. Our uh, working week is a five plus two, which is not common in the dairy sector. So five days on, two days off. Um, our weekends are always Friday, Saturday or Saturday, Sunday. Um, we offer a lot of in-house training. We do external training with VET, um, machinery companies. Um, and we've also, uh, this year, I've brought in a recruitment consultant who's done actually some team bonding exercises as well. What we view is that we will bring people in. Not everybody can progress, but if I can bring somebody in as say a herdsman or herdsperson, and they can work for us for two or three years, give us a very good two or three years, we can train them and upskill them. And then they get to the stage where they might want to manage a herd. We're quite happy then for them to go off. There's no opportunity with us to go off and, and manage a herd elsewhere. Um, with that also in mind, we sort of tried to start training our own um, next cab off the rank, as I call it. So in the last 12 months, we've, we've started an apprenticeship scheme with Victor Agricultural College to train, you know, train, our, um, train our next members of staff coming through. And be that again, whether they work for us or whether they work elsewhere. Um, so it's very encouraging for me to hear today, to hear that there's, there's people out there looking for work. Um, looking to get into the um, agriculture industry and actually what Fiona was, um, was speaking about previously you know, would be a really good link because we are of a size where we can offer opportunity um, to gain skills um, and we are not necessarily recruiting people from a farming background. We, we you know, across the board of our 11 members of staff, yes, seven are from farming backgrounds um, and 10 of the 11 um, originate from seven. Um, so we have been traditionally local and, 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 and you know, farming based, but um, our, uh, our current apprentice um, lives in Exeter um, and um, a, a was brought up in an urban environment. Um, and we would welcome you know, trying to diversify into different workplaces, um, sorry, into different um, avenues to get people into the workplace. Uh, it's, it's, it's interesting hearing other people comment because one of the mantras that we put on the most recent yeah. adverts were, was enthusiasm is more important than experience. Um, so what, what I'm kind of hearing now is perhaps we as farmers, are perhaps we're advertising in the wrong place with uh, traditional methods and, and we need to look broader and, and, and tie up with, with people such as Fiona and, and working more um, across the board with our recruitment. So. That would be something I would think we would consider off the back of this today. Um, but yeah, it's a very specific thing that is there's a underpins my recruitment. It is hard currently to find people with either um, initially an experience, although that is less important, with an enthusiasm for milk cows. Um, and that is, you know, for me, that is a concern currently and, and going forward. Thank you, um, Paul. That's great. Uh, now I'm going to call on uh, Beverly Dixon. Now, Beverly, you are uniquely qualified because um, I don't know many other agricultural, actively agricultural companies that have an HR director and deal with recruitment, deal with uh, career progression and that sort of thing. And uh, so you would be very insightful and experienced on this and we look forward to your contribution. Thank you, Richard, and thank you for inviting me. I'm delighted to kind of be part of this panelist um, team. Um, perhaps if I just kind of set the context of G's and then you'll perhaps uh, understand why G's have invested in having an HR director. I've been here for 13 years now. Um, and I, I then kind of will talk through um, some of the things that are the top, top of my agenda. And I think you'll see that they concur directly with what Caroline presented earlier, every single one of them, I think. Um, so G's is an international fresh produce business, and we operate um, in the UK, Spain, Poland, Czech, Senegal, and America. Um, and we supply all the UK supermarkets and lots in Europe, and uh, some, some worldwide too. So to do all of that, I've got 8,000 colleagues and they are employed somewhere 
in the world at any one time. And around three and a half thousand of those are seasonal. So our biggest operational areas are UK and Spain. So in the summer now, we've got three and a half thousand seasonal workers in the UK and Spain's dropped down because it's in the low season. They've still got some. And then it's the opposite way around in the winter. So it's pretty flat all year round. There's 8,000 people. Um, so what do I spend the majority of my time doing it is all around talent acquisition and development. And that's with the purpose of being able to attract great people in, into our business, but into our sector. Um, and more importantly, retain them and help them to be the best they can be. And that's all different types of people on different types of contract. So if I just talk about the UK, um, as I say, three and a half thousand seasonal uh, colleagues, then we've got around 1,800 or just under 2,000 permanent colleagues, um, of which 500 um, of those will be um, salaried staff. And they'll be in the professional roles, some of the support services. So if I just go to the seasonal workers, um, of course, like everyone, um, we, we signed up to the Feed the Nation campaign and picked for Britain last year. And we recruited 500 people from the UK out of our total um, three and a half thousand. And um, it was a really interesting experience and we did learn lots from those people and happy to kind of share that with you. Um, but around 20 of those, we then retained into permanent jobs. And so that some of those people are still with us now. <laughs> but in the year-round roles, and uh, they've taken on kind of their professional careers. Um, we've also um, engaged with lots of the things that we've talked about. So Fiona, you know, we've engaged in recruiting people from ex-military, and there's lots of people in our um, in, in particular roles from the military. Um, we've we've done, we've had programs for ex-offenders and homeless people. But the one thing I would say that really um, makes it quite tricky to do those things is the location. And that won't be just G's that's facing that. That'll be, you know, lots of farming businesses. It, it can be quite difficult for people to either travel to or they don't want to relocate to the particular areas in which the, the roles are operating. Um, but then if I think about the year-round permanent people, we've got early careers programs, we've got a two-year graduate training scheme, um, that's supported with leadership development, business training, and coaching and mentoring alongside of that. Um, with, with lots of efforts going into retaining millennials and Generation Z. So we hear that those Gen Zs are going to have 17 jobs in their lifetime. That's one heck of a labour turnover figure to, to manage. We're finding the people that come to us after in their second jobs tend to stay longer. And also we've adopted the approach that if we can provide more than one role within the same company, then that might retain them longer. And the idea is to retain them long, as long as possible. Um, but I know it won't be forever. Um, and then some of the learning and development that we do, we adopt the Dan Pink model of purpose, mastery and autonomy. So really important to connect people with purpose which is all around what is it that we're here for and really helping them, whoever they are, whatever level of role people are working in, really connect them with why they're here and how does that fit with what they want to do every day, um, which obviously if you're happy in your work and is a great place to work, um, then um, it's, not, it's not hard work. Um, that's, and the other thing I would say is soft skills now, the new hard skills, um, so our leadership development is really important because in order to be able to attract and retain great people, they tend to stay because they're working with great colleagues and because of their manager. So support using 360 feedback um, and that, that type of thing is really helpful for the management teams. Um, then obviously there's the technical skills and you're really kind of investing in people's technical ability. And some practical stuff, like when people come out of 
being um, a student, they don't necessarily even know how to use Excel because they tend to use different platforms. So, you know, some of the things that you might think, uh, you know, people would already have those skills really need investment. Um, I think I've, oh, the one other thing before I sign off Richard um, is um, my role also includes ethical working. So around the world, making sure that we've got robust processes and procedures and the ability to take remedial action in order to prevent modern slavery or exploitation. And I know um, obviously when we're recruiting around the world and in, from around the world, and particularly you know, bringing people to the UK, it's really important to be able to kind of have those audit procedures um, in place. And also to the, highlight the importance of worker voice, so really listening and watching out for what people have to say and then addressing any concerns that you might have. Um, I think that's just given a really speedy overview of the role and I can already see in the chat there's some questions that um, I'd be delighted to have a go anyway at answering. Thanks very much indeed for that Beverly and welcome to Caroline and Matt back onto the line. Um, okay, um, so what I'm going to do is start pulling through the questions and you can probably see them on the uh, Q&A anyhow and if I can just um, briefly sum up a question from Henry Robertson. He's saying our industry is one that it continually suffers from increased costs and reduced um, sales prices. Um, he says that uh, we are one of the few industries. I'm sure every industry uh, suffers from that. I recollect my parents buying a television a lot more expensively than it was today. So probably television manufacturers have the same issue. But if we look at um, increased costs, one of the biggest attractions that we can make uh, uh, for um, recruitment is to pay higher wages. How can we afford to pay higher wages, summing up what Henry Robertson is saying, and still produce uh, cheap, affordable food? Anybody want to pick up on that one? <laughs> Hands up. I'm looking for a volunteer. I can't quite find my hand. I'm happy to have a go, Richard. There you go, Beverly. Yeah, thank um, you. Yeah, um, this is something that we discuss quite regularly, um, being in the fresh produce industry. And um, I agree, Henry, it's uh, in addition to potentially paying people more, it's also about having the investment in the technology, the mechanisation, the enormous amount of investment that we've got to do in order to be able to create more interesting roles for people to be able to take up and then we can pay people more. So there's an enormous amount of investment. We do want to treat people well, pay them great wages and create the great place to work, which of course might be non-financial benefits, but somehow you know, need to be paid for. And then there's all the ethical work that I've talked about that uh, certainly in the fresh produce industry is a significant investment. And um, I think the dilemma is being able to stay competitive across and have a level playing field across Europe um, because the alternative is to for products to be brought in from outside that's grown outside the UK potentially more cheaply um, and therefore a level playing field is really important um, and then I think it's everything that we can do in order to help the consumer um, to understand what goes into producing great food um, and I, I don't think that's a quick turnaround. Um, so I, I know it's not the answer to the question, but they're my thoughts on the subject. Sheena, is there a way that we can work smarter, or Tess as well, can we work smarter to be more productive to manage this cost burden of increased wages to attract people into the industry? Do I go, I'll go first then. Um, Working smarter, I think one of the, the key areas, just being involved in farming myself, and that's one of the things we're always speaking about, is how can we work smarter? How can we um, save costs? How can we improve our bottom line? And um, it depends as well as what type of agriculture you're into, because it's across the board. 
um, the likes of the dairy industry are working, a lot of them are now working with robotics, less staff as well, um, and other industries very heavily, um, like to the horticulture industry, a lot of them, we need more staff rather than, because it's a lot of it's very um, hands-on. So it's a very difficult question to answer when we've got so many different types of agriculture and been able to work smarter. Um, just as Beverly said, um, technology is going to be one of the key areas. Um, green skills as well, um, you know, low carbon farming. It's all the skills that are going to be needed going forward um, that we at the moment probably don't know all the skills that are going to be required. But it's something that's going to be definitely going to have to be looked at going forward. I think green skills and low carbon farming um, is going to be a, a buzzword going forward. Tess? Yeah, I, th I think there's always room to work smarter, but that means different things for different people, doesn't it? And it, it's about looking at things in a different way. I, mean, I, I was working with one manager who was being sold a very shiny, expensive machine for his, for his business, which we all get attracted to. But actually, when he did a full analysis of it, it was still worth keeping the labour that he had. And there will be a tipping point at some point where that labour is more expensive than buying the shiny new machine. But everybody needs to look at their own business and, and what can be improved. And I think one concept we use, which gets quite a lot of traction is the, the 10 pound, 100 pound, 1000 pound an hour jobs and who's doing those jobs because we quite often have people at the higher end of management still doing the lower end jobs that you could get people in to do. And I think as an industry, we're always very cautious about bringing in extra labor where actually bringing in some specialist labor might seem more expensive, but actually it releases you to do better and different things for the business. So I think we just need to look at the way we, we utilize our staff in a more efficient way a lot of the time. David, you very often sat on both sides of the fence where as an employer, as an advisor to people, uh, as chairman of a corporate farming company and sitting in a membership organization such as the CLO, where there are these continual challenges. Uh, what experience can you offer? I think the reason everyone was reluctant to answer the question is because it's a fundamental question that's addressing most people in agriculture right across the board, um, because no politician ever uh, furthered their career by upping the price of food if they could do that in a policy sense. So, um, so we have to accept the fact that um, you know we have to find different routes to the market, um, and and we have to uh, maybe there are too many people. In, in that route to market, uh, all requiring a bit of a slice of the action, which actually makes it much more difficult. Um, I think so, so some fundamental reassessment of the way you do business is the way you do it. And it's really difficult to do that, particularly on a smaller farm with a family involved, but it does need to be done nevertheless. And, and I think all of us, I, I've come across uh, loads of small savings that can be made by doing things differently. And I think, you know, everybody says that the farming industry is a great industry to work with. And bankers say that, um, people who, who are suppliers say that. And one of the reasons they say that is because farmers are very conservative about actually switching who they use, who they work with and, and, uh, and reducing their costs. And if they were do, to do that a bit more, they would be able to reduce it a bit. But having said that, you have to get the right price for your product. And one of the interesting things will be whether or not we can get prices from new products like biodiversity net gain, other areas where carbon comes into it. And I, I think you know, we shouldn't be too depressed. I think if we're smart on our feet, there, is, there are going to be some new markets we need to look at, which may help uh, give us an extra income line at the top. Thank you. Fiona, I'm going to come to you in a second, but before we move off this topic, Paul, your company's added value to increase some um, bottom line opportunities. Uh, you probably wouldn't want everybody to try to brand their products. And if you're producing mainstream milk or cereal products, those sort of things, it's not so easy to um, brand a commoditized thing. But are there any tips that you can look, um, offer viewers about anything that you've created that adds value that still would uh, live with the commoditized production that most agricultural producers live with? Um, I think it's important to have, uh, well, one thing I would say, first and foremost, we're profitable producing milk. So our core business as a farm is profitable. And that's the most fundamentally important element. So 
to me, running the farm side of things, it doesn't matter to me whether the milk goes to our cheese or goes or is externally sold. It is profitable. So I would say we you always got to make sure that the, the the bottom line works for each enterprise rather than doing it for a reason um, to create. You know, if the niche the niche um, or the brand should add value to another area of the business, you should be sustainable as it is. So I think that's the thing is not looking to to support a farm business by doing something that um, is not going to stand the test in the in the commercial farming environment because that essentially is where we're going to be long term regardless of um, and when I talk, say long term I mean you know decades and decades in farming rather than um, over the short term um, so whilst whilst our brand certainly helps and adds value to the business the essential core farming side of the business has got to remain profitable. I think, though, the size of your two dairy herds, you've answered uh, Henry Robertson's question that uh, economies of scale play a role in that as well. Um, oh, absolutely. I, I mean, and that allows us to be you know, exactly where we are. Yeah, we have to have that number of cows yeah. um, and a number that I'm actually incre you know, actively increasing at the moment. Um, can I move on then to a question for you, Fiona, uh, where there are this, this perception of negative experience by people from uh, non-agricultural backgrounds entering our industry. What do your um, military or ex-military people think of farming before they start on the journey of gaining first-hand experience? So thanks. I mean, it's a really interesting area because it is a blind spot to people coming out of the forces. Um, it's very difficult to find a central um, source of information on farming and horticulture um, to those who are leaving. There is um, a very good process of supporting service leavers in that final year, in some cases two years, of leaving the forces and for a short period afterwards. Um, it's a, a partnership that's um, set up by the Ministry of Defence and it's very generous. It's one of the most um, generous and supportive um, career change schemes in the country and there is money attached to it to be spent with third parties on training, significant money. Um, but um, it has very limited exposure to um, food and farming at the moment, um, something that myself and some of the other organisations that Caroline has highlighted in the report are trying to change. Um, and I have had some discussions with HDB um, and uh, a couple of years ago with um, with your own worshipful company about how we might do that. Um, we, um, so it, it's an, it is invisible, um, a term someone else used earlier. It is invisible at the moment. Um, and so it, Rural Inc is spending a lot of time investing in making the noise and making the um, change in the narrative amongst the service population so that this becomes a more visible um, career option. Um, one of the things we're doing, which is very similar to what Landry Scotland um, are doing, is we, we've put in place a career transition rural business management course, which is a two-week course specifically aimed at managers coming out of the forces to give them that bridge across from the services. And with all these wonderful skills that leaders and managers um, bring from the services to just take the risk edge off potential employers in farming um, and, uh, and horticulture to be able to employ them and to give those individuals, of course, the confidence and credibility applied Thanks to the for that. Job. Thank but you for that, Fiona. And I hope, Alex Black, the questioner, you've got some answers to your challenge. If I can then move on to Ansk Venters. Uh, he's talking about seasonal workers, but if we talk about all workers, and uh, he's asking uh, what are the biggest challenges I'm going to make it more difficult for you, panel. I'm going to ask you, what are the solutions to uh, provide the uh, cover, uh, overcome the greatest challenges? And Beverly, you've been in, you're in recruitment all of the time. Uh, is more money, our greater career projects, opportunities, and those sort of things? They have been picked up in the in the report about those are some of the issues. But for the smaller fa family farming operator who might only employ one or two people. How does he overcome those sorts of challenges? Um, I think um, 
Yes, so, so some of the feedback that we certainly got from employing UK residents last year in seasonal roles um, is it was all around flexibility. And it's actually kind of understanding that make, it, having that balance between people's lives and work and, because it, and, and that's quite a cultural change. So for someone who's in a harvest season or a peak season, then we all know it's kind of, you know, all hands on deck. And, um, but that's not what everyone wants. And so being able to have flexible shift patterns and, and, and also treating people as individuals and not necessarily whole teams is another concept that we had to address. Um, and then, you know, just changing the kind of the way, asking people what it is that they want to set them up for success. So it, is, it, 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 takes, it would take a lot of investment. Um, and I think it is that treating people as individuals. And then also, um, you know, UK residents don't really solely want summer jobs or, or seasonal work. So that's fine if you're um, possibly a student and want to do it for a few weeks. Um, but again, it's treating people as individuals and not expecting them to do the whole season. They might just okay. want to do two or three weeks. Thanks for that, Barry. Very quickly, does anybody else want to contribute to ANSC's uh, what are the solutions to providing uh, recruitment opportunities? Quickly round the panel. Yes, Sheena. Um, I think industry need to uh, play a big part in this. They actually need to start talking up the industry because um, I think that um, people's perception of the industry is sometimes through um, industry themselves. Um, a lot of the... We, did a skills matching service last year because of this um, uh, to try and get local people um, to support the horticulture businesses. We had 1,200 people volunteered um, and when they went to work on some of the farms, um, when the uh, migrant workers actually uh, came in, they were literally said, we don't need you anymore. And I think um, some of the experiences they've had are not necessarily the positive. So then they tell others about it. Um, they also said that, you know, that the feedback was the industry talks themselves down all the time. It's always negative. And I think it's our responsibility that are in the industry to make sure we are selling agriculture as a really positive industry to come into. Anybody else got some solutions? Caroline? I just want to say how much I agree with, um, with both of you and particularly um, what Beverly said just now and what everybody's commented on in, in terms of the matching. So it isn't I think in the past it's always been thought about in terms of matching the right worker to the farmer with not that much consideration taken into account for um, the employee themselves. So I think it's just really important to take into consideration what the needs of the workers are now as well. And I think that's where the key change will occur. Thank you, David. Just to say that one of the, thing, uh, the difficulties I think we have is that we still have a very uh, family orientated farming industry in many cases. And those farms, you are, if you come on uh, as an outside worker, you're not part of the family. So it does, you know, it does make it quite difficult because you realise that there's going to be no promotional opportunities for you because the family are going to take the sort of top jobs. So what people have got to do is change their, their attitude to the people coming onto farms to work for them. And I think they haven't yet really worked that out, but I think that they are doing so more. And the far-sighted ones are the ones that make people feel part of the enterprise. And, and that can be also include uh, being rewarded based on the success of the enterprise rather than just a wage. Because if, if people go with the flow and actually when there's a good year and there is some profitability, they have a bit more in their pocket. And that's the sort of way in which you make people feel part of it. Yeah, no, it is about leadership skills. Very important, aren't they? You're quite right. Right, I'm going to go on to the next question now from Stephen Ramsden. Uh, do the speakers see a role for ELMS for public payments for public good type policy to help with the labour issues? So are we going to be able to tap in to ELMS to support labour in rural communities? Anybody got an answer on that one? Come on. I, I, I would give an answer, but I'm just the mere chairman. So it's up to you to put your hands up. Yes, Beverly. 
you're on mute. I think um, investing in, um, if, if, if people have um, accessed ELMS, I think that should possibly be predicated on having um, in, it, it, having to invest in people, whether that be making sure that they train people well on the subject matter of the ELMS um, section that they're, that they're working on, um, or whether it be anything in and around modern slavery and, and ethical working. So it should be a criteria in order to access that fund. Um, Matt. Yeah, just, just briefly, it's, it's really interesting. DEFRA are taking an interesting approach to ELM. And in the pilot scheme, they're going to be paying farmers um, a, a kind of learning allowance in, in order to take part in research and kind of professional development. So I, th I think I think there is an element there where um, ELM will involve kind of upskilling people in terms of their, their environmental management. And we also know, you know, there are people who are kind of professional agri-environmental contractors. So these, these kind of schemes do do create work um, and employment opportunities for people. And if you go right back to, to the 1980s, when there was a, a, an early pilot scheme in the Peak District, they ran out of skilled wallers because suddenly there was such a demand for, for people to, to be restoring, um, uh, you know, iconic dry stone walls. So I think ELM is a way of supporting employment, but you know it's not going to provide a solution on it on its own, and and people certainly shouldn't be thinking of it in terms of a, a replacement for for BPS because you know it is not at all. Uh, what you're saying really is people go where the money is, don't they? And yeah. it was well, ever thus. Yep, yeah, follow yeah. the money. Um, at at um, uh, at Dyson, we employ people that are um, working entirely on environmental work. Uh, it's not a profitable part of our business. If you actually look at the uh, money that comes in from stewardship schemes and so on at the moment, and some of those are rolling to Elm, um, we are uh, we are uh, employing people to make sure that we stay the right side of the rules and that we do have an environmental side to our business. But at the moment, we haven't yet made it profitable. I think that we've got to look at, um, you know, following what Matt said, we've got, you know, there has to be something on the bottom line as a result of having people involved in this area. And um, we've got to get good at what we're doing um, uh, on the environmental side. Certainly, it's something also that TIA are going to have to think about in terms of uh, pointing people towards those sort of skills. But you've got to have something that lasts as Matt says, you know, uh, the, too, much, too often these schemes have changed too rapidly and what you've got people to, uh, good at doing one thing is they change to do another. I think we have got some hope, but it's not going to be profitable yet for a while. Okay, and uh, panel, you've had some supportive comments from on the uh, chat line from David Bolton and Carolina Camacho Villa. So I think you're hitting the right note there. It isn't just about selling produce it's tapping into where the money is, is what people are recognizing. And it doesn't have to be about productive farming. It might be the, some of these other softer areas of environmental farming instead. I'm going to bring the uh, Q&A to a close there. Thank you very much indeed, panelists, for your contribution. Uh, can I now call upon Professor Matt Lobley to do a summary and co concluding remarks, please? Yeah, thanks, Richard. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm going to keep this brief because I know we are running out of time. It's been a really fascinating uh, discussion around the the really multifaceted challenges that, that are facing agriculture generally and specifically around the, the, the labour issue. And because there are so many different types of challenge, obviously, there's no one single blueprint. There's no one single solution. We need to address all sorts of different aspects and it's been really interesting to hear the the emphasis placed on on training and leadership training um which i think is going to be very important and i often think we we are so much of our farmers you know it's not just enough to produce food anymore as we've just been discussing it's about producing a a, a rich environment providing you know a great a great work environment as well and we're going to ask more of our farmers now um, because we're saying you know, they really do need to up their game as a sector when it comes to recruitment, retention and rewarding staff in order to get the, the, best, the best staff. And I think that point was very well made earlier on that actually, you know, 
it's not just farms that are competing with each other to attract the best labor they're competing with other sectors often other sectors that will provide you know maybe better holidays shorter working weeks all sorts of things that people might might be looking for so i think there really is a, a need to um really kind of game changing point at the moment and and waiting around for somebody else to solve this is not a solution we all of us who are involved in agriculture need to address these issues and need to work together to, to address these issues and we've seen some great examples of businesses and, and initiatives who are who are doing that and are providing leadership and providing thought leadership in in all of this um, and another point I wanted to make um, is about diversity in agriculture or more precisely the the lack of it um we've had the the you know number of people talk about the the gender dimension i just wanted to give one example for some research i did different project with a, a colleague rebecca wheeler and this was funded by nfu mutual and we were looking at succession and retirement we did a survey of about 700 farmers and of those that said they had a successor 72 percent had identified a son right 72 percent only 18% had identified a daughter, despite those families having roughly, you know, same numbers of sons and daughters in them. This is a real issue we have to challenge. If we want to recruit the best future business leaders, because that's what we're talking about, we need to recruit from the best possible pool. And so there's a, there's a, you know, that's just one example of diversity. Obviously, there's a lot of other diversity issues that need to be addressed. So I think it's, um, it's becoming a bit of a cliche to say that you know agriculture is going through the the the, the greatest change for for 70 years but you know it's true and having a more professionalized approach to agricultural labor is just going to be part of that as well and i know it's not necessarily easy and we've we've had some examples where you know smaller family farms are, are, are going to find this hard but it's about working together and working collaboratively in order to help move the industry forward and you know i've i've been doing research on farmers and with farmers for yeah. over 30 years now and um they're amazing you know they don't they're not they're not clock watchers they will you know they don't say right it's 5 30 that's it i'm knocking off they get the job done and you know things like that are great skills and farmers are, have a lot of transferable skills that they don't often recognize in themselves and i think somebody said i think it might be sheena about the industry talks itself down it needs to talk itself up more and it needs to like i say take a more professionalized approach and if that's if that's one of the things that could come out of this research that 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 you kindly funded richard then i think that would be that would be really great so this is i think just the the start of a of a journey to develop that oh, i'm gonna Good. leave it there thank you matt well we were on uh the media at fire with the farming today program first thing this morning we're in the uh general media i hope we get picked up by the agricultural media too we now have hard copies. Here's a hard copy of the document. There's also a flip builder online as well. You will also be able to watch this on YouTube. And so we've got every means of communication of getting that message out there. This is an essential industry. Ask anybody that hasn't eaten for two days whether or not we're a requirement. We can certainly go without our holidays for two days, but food is not one of those things we can go without. So let's champion our cause. I've had a great time having this as a career. And so we've got to create a career opportunity for lots of other people. I've got several thank yous. Thank you for the Worshipful Company of Farmers for allowing me to do uh, um, commission this research um, report. Thank you for Exeter for doing the grunt work behind the scenes because I've been uh, quite uh, re requesting. I won't make it hopefully too demanding and you have turned up trumps all the way through the process. So thank you for that. Thank you to our panelists. Thank you to the John, a John Oldacre Charitable Trust. And just as importantly, thank you for you, all the participants viewing at home, go out and sell a positive story, keep selling it and tell it long to as many people as you can, because our industry needs good people from any source and we want to create good career opportunities for a prosperous industry. Thank you very much indeed, all of you, and I wish you all an enjoyable day for the rest of it. It's rained here, so we can be pleased about that as farmers, perhaps as well. Bye-bye.